Well, I thought it might be interesting tonight, since this is a presidential election year, to just review the presidential contests of the last 150 years or so, and I think there are some lessons to be learned from it, especially from it, especially with regard to voting this year. You know, in the 19th century, the Democrats were the party of smaller government. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was really one of the founders of the party, and they had such notables as Andrew Jackson in power uh, during the first part of the 19th century. And generally speaking, the Democrats were for smaller government. The Whigs were for bigger government, the Whigs being the successors to the Federalists, the party of George Washington. And the Whigs wanted high tariffs, they wanted corporate welfare, and they wanted easy money. Well, the Whigs died out. I'm not really sure why it is that the Whig Party died out around 1850 or so, but they were succeeded by the Republicans, who just simply adopted the Whig platform. And so for the latter part of the 19th century, the last 50 years of the 1800s, the Republicans were the party of big government, and the Democrats were the party of small government. And the Republicans pretty well held the White House for all that time because they could promise big campaign donors in corporations and so on that they would take care of them. They would protect them from foreign competition with high tariffs, and they would spend a lot of the money that came from those tariffs on corporate welfare. It might be on public works. It might be on supporting infant industries. It might be a lot of ways, but it was big government in the making. The only break in all of this were, were two terms served by Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, who was elected in 1884, lost in 1888, but then was elected again in 1892, the only president who has served two terms that were not consecutive. And Grover Cleveland, by and large, was a small government man. He believed in the Constitution, and he very often vetoed bills explicitly pointing out that there was no constitutional authority for what the Congress was trying to do. He wasn't perfect, but he was a lot better than the Republicans that served in the White House during the last 50 years of the 1800s. The Democratic Party changed, though, in 1896 when William Jennings Bryan became the nominee. Bryan was a peaceful man who, uh, as it turned out in World War I, was a great advocate of peace and opposed to Wilson's war, but he also was a big government man, and he was pretty much what we think of today as a modern liberal. He wanted more government. He wanted easy money. He wanted government to do all sorts of things, and he was the Democratic nominee three times, but he was never able to win. Meanwhile, the Republicans continued their big government ways with William McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, they set up all kinds of regulatory agencies, and these regulatory agencies really were designed to keep competition away from the big manufacturers and the railroads and other people in the country uh, who were very much in favor of these regulatory agencies, even though supposedly in the history books it said that the agencies were set up to curb the excesses of the big companies. That really wasn't true. Well, then along came Woodrow Wilson in 1912, and he followed in Bryan's footsteps as far as the big government was concerned, and he brought about the income tax, the Federal Reserve System, and a lot more big government. And it would seem that from there on, the Democrats were now the party of big government, and the Republicans responded accordingly when Warren Harding was elected in 1920. Harding's platform was a return to normalcy, get America out of international affairs, tone down government, which had gotten very, very big during the eight years of the Wilson administration, partly because of the war and partly unrelated uh, to the war. And Harding and his successor, Calvin Coolidge, who served eight years between them, did a lot to reduce the size of government, and they were the last presidents we had who made any attempt whatsoever, any serious attempt to reduce the size of government. Then 1928, we had Herbert Hoover succeeding them, but Herbert Hoover was just one more big government Republican in the mold of those that had served in the late 19th century. And Herbert Hoover instituted what a lot of historians call the first New Deal, the New Deal that preceded Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And, of course, the Depression started in 1929 at the end of the year, and Hoover was saddled with that, and he used every power that he could get lay his hands on in the government to try to get the country out of the Depression. And as I pointed out on a recent show, the 1921 recession, which was deeper and more severe than the 1929 one, was over in a year to a year and a half because the government stood aside and did nothing. But Hoover's attempts just made things worse. And when Franklin Roosevelt ran in 1932, he ran as a traditional small government Democrat, saying he wanted to reduce the federal budget by 25 percent. He wanted to reduce the bureaucracy by 25 percent. And he was elected in a landslide. And then, of course, he served four terms and did nothing uh, in keeping with his initial platform in 1932. He simply ignored the Constitution and ran roughshod over the American people, instituting all kinds of new government programs and increasing the size of government several times over. And, of course, none of these things did anything to 
and the Depression. In the late 30s, unemployment in the country was still at 19%, if you can imagine. All right, then we get into the Second World War. Roosevelt dies at the end of the war. Truman takes over and wins his upset victory in 1948 to get reelected. And, of course, government gets bigger. The Republicans were running against Roosevelt and Truman, nothing but big government Republicans. Alf Landon, Tom Dewey. Wendell Wilkie and Tom Dewey again, and none of them could beat the Democrats because they were simply trying to outpromise the greatest promisers of all. Then along comes 1952, and although Adlai Stevenson was the Democratic nominee, Truman was eligible to run again, but chose not to because he was so unpopular by the end of his second term that th- there was no chance in the world that he could get reelected. And so the Republicans really were running against Truman, even though Stevenson was a Democratic nominee. Dwight Eisenhower was the Republican candidate. He was not a small government Republican. He was what they called at the time a modern Republican, a liberal Republican, in other words. And Robert Taft had been Mr. Republican uh, and was the conservative whom Eisenhower defeated at the Republican convention. Eisenhower won. He actually reduced the federal budget in the first and second year of his term. But by the end of his eight years, government had grown considerably over what he had inherited from Truman. Then in 1960, along came John F. Kennedy, followed by Lyndon Johnson, as you know. Government grew and grew and grew. And then the Republicans in 1968, nominated Richard Nixon. Most Republicans already had a great dislike for Richard Nixon, and so they didn't give him a lot of support, but because he was running against Hubert Humphrey, and the country was fed up with the Vietnam War, and they thought Nixon would do something about it, Nixon won, uh, even though it was a very, very close election. And then, of course, Nixon was like the third New Deal. He just followed through with a great society. He instituted wage and price control, started the EPA, OSHA, uh, all kinds of federal programs were started under Richard Nixon. And then when he resigned, Gerald Ford took his place and followed through in much the same way that Nixon had been. Along came Jimmy Carter. And then finally, the 1980 election, which was probably the most clear-cut choice that we had in the 20th century, second only perhaps to who, uh, second only perhaps to Harding versus Wilson in 1920, and that was Ronald Reagan versus Jimmy Carter. Ronald Reagan promising to get government off our backs, the Democrats accusing him of wanting to repeal the minimum wage laws, wanting to bankrupt Social Security by making it voluntary for some people and so on, and Reagan won in a landslide. People have said over and over that the American people have chosen security over liberty. Well, the only elections in the 20th century when there was a clear-cut choice between liberty and security, liberty won, and 1980 was an example of it. Of course, Ronald Reagan did none of the things that he promised in 1980, and government grew by two-thirds, two-thirds the federal budget grew during the eight years of Reagan's term. George Bush followed. George Bush managed to defeat Dukakis, but was just one more big government Republican. And we'll finish up this little story when we come back and get to the point of it. This is Harry Brown. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Harry Brown here. And I've been talking about the presidential elections of the last 150 years or so, giving history a very broad brush here and not going into any detail. We were up to George H.W. Bush, the father of the current president, who was elected in 1988 and was just another big government Republican. And then he was succeeded by Bill Clinton, unable to shake the fact that George Bush had said that there would be no new taxes under his regime, and then he put through a very large tax increase. So he lost a lot of the people who might have supported him, and Clinton was elected. And while the Republicans spent eight years demonizing Bill Clinton, he really was no worse than Ronald Reagan or George Bush in terms of increasing the size of government. In fact, government grew more slowly under Clinton, even in the first two years while he had a Democratic president, than the government grew under Reagan or Bush. And, of course, the Republicans made a big thing about Clinton wanting to socialize medicine, But then as soon as they took over the Congress, the Republicans started passing the Clinton program piece by piece with the Kennedy-Kassenbaum bill, the Kennedy-Hatch bill, and a whole lot of other bills that put the government deeper and deeper into health care. And plus, Clinton could never have tried to pass his health care program if it hadn't been for Lyndon Johnson back in the 60s who brought about Medicare and Medicaid and put the government so deeply into health care that it created the kinds of problems that Clinton could exploit in the 1990s and say we have to have the government in here to help out people who are suffering from high prices and so on. So anyway we had eight years of Clinton and now we have had three years of George Bush and George Bush of course has been growing the government even faster than Bill Clinton has. Now what's the point of all of this? Well, anyone who has paid any attention to history at all, uh, the history of presidential elections and presidents who have been elected, shouldn't have been the least bit surprised that George Bush has turned out to be a big government politician, that George Bush is happy to get into war, that George Bush is happy to get the government deeper into education, deeper into health care, deeper into welfare, deeper into all of these things, because that's the way it has been, Republican president after Republican president. It doesn't matter. Ever since we have had these two major parties, which started about 18 
1950, the Republicans and the Democrats. What we have had are big government people with just the slightest uh, or the fewest uh, exceptions coming along, people like Grover Cleveland, Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and that's about it. Everybody else has just used the office as soon as he got it to expand his power, to expand the size of government, to reward his friends, to punish his enemies, to impose more regulations on the American people, to make it harder to be in business, to make it harder to earn a living and take home enough to be able to take care of your family. All of these things have proceeded regardless of which party is in power. And so in the year 2004, all I can say to you is if you vote for a Democrat, John Kerry or anybody else, or George W. Bush the Republican, you will deserve what you get because you should know better. You should understand that the first step in stopping the growth of government is to quit supporting the people who are making government bigger. As long as you support them, as long as you vote for them, they will take your vote as an endorsement of what they're doing, and they will lay it on you, layer after layer after layer of government on your back. It doesn't matter whether you think they're the lesser of two evils. The fact of the matter is they will accept your vote as an endorsement of big government, and you will get what you deserve, which is more and more government, because that's exactly what you voted for. You really have only two choices. Number one, don't vote at all. Don't give them your support. Or secondly, vote libertarian, which is a clear-cut vote for smaller government, whoever turns out to be the libertarian presidential candidate. There is no third choice that I know of. And when I say one and two there, I'm not saying that not voting is better than voting libertarian. I'm saying that those are the two choices. And I imagine that I will go to the polls in November and vote libertarian, even though I've only voted about a half a dozen times in the 70 years of my life. <laughs> I voted in the late 50s a few times, and then I didn't vote again until 1996 when I went to the polls and voted for Harry Brown for president and voted again in the year 2000. And I will probably go to the polls this year and vote for the Libertarian candidate. But I can tell you this, that if you don't want to vote for the Libertarian candidate, then don't vote at all. It only encourages them. Well, when we come back, we're going to go to the phones and see what's going on out in the real world. And you can join the fun by calling 1-800-510-TALK, 1-800-510-8255. And this is Harry Brown. I'll be back shortly. Let's talk first with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Hey, good evening, Harry. I want to say that if you ever become a pastor and start a libertarian church, let me know, because I want to be in your congregation. <laughs> um, Amen, brother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I want to say that I think the topic of tonight's show is a great one. And I want to point out that many candidates, Republicans and, and sometimes Democrats, do run talking like libertarians, and yet they seem to have no concept of it, what it means, or they think people are too stupid to realize that they're not doing anything specific or talk about, talking about anything specific to uh, reduce government. I was at a convention this weekend at which uh, John McCain, Senator John McCain from Arizona, uh, was being interviewed by Peter Jennings of ABC News. And Peter Jennings asked Senator McCain, who ran for president in 2000, obviously lost the nomination to George Bush, asked him about the recent FCC indecency fiasco and whether it was possible to define indecency, et cetera. And McCain said, well, interestingly enough, he, he's a Republican, but he's a very libertarian Republican. Oh, yeah. And, you know, this is from the champion of campaign finance reform, of more gun control laws, uh, a major opponent of tax cuts, a huge cheerleader for the Iraq war, so on and so forth. And it just... Most people in the audience who, I guess, don't pay that much attention to um, politics, even though it was a, a convention of, of broadcasters and people of that nature who should, um, kind of nodded their head in agreement. And I just was, you know, I, it was all I could do to not uh, toss back up my lunch. But uh, Well, you know, it's a, there's an old expression, I think it was Emerson that said, hypocrisy is the homage that vice pays the virtue, meaning that the reason people are hypocritical is because they recognize the importance of virtue. And so even while they're being viceful, they act as though they're being virtuous. And in the same way, McCain's statements were the homage that Republicans pay to libertarians. They recognize that people want to hear libertarian sentiments. And so they make these. I've said several times in the 2000 election in the campaign during radio and television interviews, I'd say Republicans campaign like libertarians, but then they govern like Democrats. And, of course, that's what it is. But they do campaign like libertarians because they know that there is a great desire among people to be freer, to have lower taxes, to have less government messing around with their lives, and to just get all of this stuff off of their back. And so that's why people like John McCain say things like that. But, of course, as you pointed out, his voting record and his uh, whole attitude towards government in reality is exactly the opposite of what he was saying. Yeah, exactly. And it just solidified in my mind that we're never going to get anywhere with, with these two parties because as long as they feel like they don't have a real, neither one of them is going to offer a real libertarian alternative, they don't have to 
Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't have to change anything. No, of course not, uh, because there are so many people who will vote for them for the simple reason that they are not Democrats. That's exactly. all the reason that they need. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Always glad to hear from you. Thank you. you. On the FCC thing that Jonathan alluded to, McCain making remarks about, Sonia in Osprey, Florida, sent me an email saying, I've just been to the FCC's official website and have been informed that even though the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, the FCC says that, quote, only expressions of views that do not involve a clear and present danger of serious substantive evil come under the protection of the Constitution, unquote. Interesting. And she says, where do they come up with this stuff? Uh, Sonia, if you don't mind, send me the link to that particular uh, page, web page that uh, has that statement on it, and I'll put the link up on the radio links page of the website. There's nothing on that page right now for tonight's broadcast, but I will put that on perhaps at whatever break follows getting that email from Sonia. Well, let's go now to Tampa, Florida, and talk with Brian. Good evening, Brian. Brian, are you with us? Yeah, I am. Well, hello, Brian. How are you doing this evening? Just fine. What's up? Um, but let's touch on what that one guy said. Is, um, when you hear on the news, anytime the Republicans or Democrats have something that agrees with what the Cato Institute says, they always, you know, point out that you know, that's what the Cato Institute thinks, but they dismiss the, you know, the whole libertarian as a whole. They dismiss it as, um, as being, um, wacko. Yeah, pretty, <laughs> that's what I was looking for. <laughs> Too extreme. Yeah. Um, just I had a question. You know, there's, I always see the statistics on the, you know, how taxes keep going up and how the budget keeps going up. Is there any statistics on the self-funding of government, you know, the profit? property forfeiture, fines, tariffs, seized bank accounts, the, the money they're finding in Iraq, etc. Well, that's a pretty good question. I would think that by this time somebody at Cato or the Independent Institute or even the Heritage Foundation by now would have dug out those figures and found out because there are very, very, very detailed budget volumes that go into exactly how much came from this, how much came from that within a department. And so somebody who was interested could find out how much they've realized from asset forfeiture, how much they've realized from fees, how much from fines and penalties and and so on. You know, when the EPA goes into a small business like a dry cleaner or somebody and says, you're in violation here, you have too many toxic waste too near the employees or something like that, and fine them $15,000, that money goes into the federal treasury. And you know, in some cases, these fines run into millions and millions of dollars, and so it's very conceivable that this self-funding, as you refer to it, could amount to more than a billion dollars a year and perhaps even several billion dollars a year when you take into all the, the possible sources of that. It still probably is a drop in the bucket to compare to what the IRS is taking out of us by putting matches under our fingernails. <laughs> yeah, I work for a small company with about 40 employees, and, um, and we spend tens of thousands of dollars just complying with, you know, federal regulations, and that's not complying with the intent of the regulations. That's complying with the regulations. And as, probably, the, as the regulators interpret it. Yeah, and we probably spend you know, an additional twenty thousand dollars in fines, which um, which we we were complying with the intent of the rule, but not complying with um. The inspector's interpretation. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I shouldn't laugh, but it really is. Um, it really is unfortunate. Uh, there's a, a very good book that uh, came out a year or so ago called Mugged by the. It's either mugged by the state or mugged by the government. It's not within my eyesight right now, but maybe I can give the title a little later, which goes into all of the various things that you're talking about, of, of how mostly small businesses are just really run over like steamrollers uh, from government inspectors, government regulators, and so on. A, a typical example, and you may have heard this before because it's been bandied around, is in several cities, people have started this braiding business where uh, black people want to get their hair braided, either in corn rolls or in, in other forms of braiding. And uh, the government comes in, the, either the state government or the city government, and says, you know, you have to have a special license for this. You have to have a cosmetology license. And in order to get a cosmetology license, you have to put in maybe 1,000 hours or 700 hours at the cosmetology school, and, you, and it will cost you maybe ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 for this education. And they don't even teach braiding at the cosmetology schools. But that's the place where they send them to. And, of course, these small businesses, Businesses that are doing this for people in the black communities uh, can't possibly afford to do that. And, and it's entirely useless because even if they went through the whole education, they would come back knowing no more about braiding than they did to begin with. And, uh, of course, you know, the EPA, OSHA, all these different agencies, the Equal Employment Agency, all of these come in, they inspect, they find 15 violations, they say, all right, now you need to pay a fine of $35,000, and maybe you even need to run an ad in the paper saying that you've been discriminating, and so you will pay money to anybody who asked for a job during the following time period and didn't get a job from us during that period, we will pay you $30,000 a piece or whatever it is. I mean, and, and we wonder 
why businesses fold, and we wonder why larger companies try to outsource, as they say, by putting their manufacturing outside the country and in other places. It's very, very plain that it just gets harder and harder to do business in this country. Well, pardon me for running off the mouth on that, Brian, but I really do have tremendous sympathy for anybody who's in business today with what you have to put up with. Even under the best of circumstances with a small government, running a business is not easy. My God, you're taking enormous risks. You're taking enormous chances with your life savings. And then on top of that, these idiots come in and presume to know more about your business than you do and tell you what you must do and tell you how you must treat your employees, tell you how you must treat your customers. Heavens, if you don't treat your employees right, they go work for somebody else. If you don't treat your customers right, they go trade with somebody else. You don't need a regulator or an inspector to come in and tell you how to treat people. It's all you can do to keep your head afloat without the inspectors. Anyway, thank you very much for calling, Brian. Right, thank you, Tom. Stay in touch with us. Let's talk now with Greg in Athens, Georgia. Good evening, Greg. Uh, hello, Mr. Ralph. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, I just had, I just had something quickly to say about you were saying how recently like, George Bush and all the presidents have become big government. Mm-hmm. I really can't blame them as much. Anymore. I mean, it's really the American people who are letting them get uh, so much power. Well, you can't expect Americans who are suffering from high taxes and have to work many times much more than eight hours a day or both husband and wife working to keep the family afloat and so forth. You can't expect these people to be paying a lot of attention to what's going on in Washington. My heavens, even the people who vote on the bills in Congress don't read the bills and don't know what's in them. And all we know about them is what the newspaper says, that this bill is going to provide certain benefits to senior citizens or whatever it may be, and nobody has any idea what the fine print is. And the American people are just not in a position to be that much of overseers of the people who run for office. And it would be one thing if we had a government that was under $100 billion and only and a Congress that only spent a couple of months a year in Washington, but we've got full-time legislators, $2 trillion budgets, and who in the world is going to keep up with all of this? I don't believe you should blame the American people for this because most of the time the American people have no knowledge what's going on. Here, let me give you a good example. There are a lot of people in this country who are concerned about gun rights. So they passed a law, however, a few years ago banning assault weapons. It was during the Clinton administration, and it had a sunset provision, which means that this year that ban on assault weapons will expire unless Congress renews it. Now, what's going to happen is that the Democrats are going to say, we want this assault weapon ban uh, extended, but at the same time, the Republicans are trying to stop lawsuits against gun manufacturers for crimes committed by people with guns. And they are going to probably get a bill passed that will block the lawsuits against gun manufacturers, but included in that bill will be an extension of the assault weapon ban. So the Republicans can go back to their constituency and say, see, we did a good thing for gun rights in this country, and they won't tell you what they have done to extend the assault weapon ban. Stay on the line, Greg. We have to take a break right now, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. We'll be back in just a minute. This is Harry Brown. Stay with us. Before I go on, I don't want to forget to tell you that Sonia did email me that link to the FCC page, and I took a brief look at it before putting it up on my Radio Links page, and it really is hilarious. And the FCC claims to know what the Constitution means. The Constitution never meant to provide freedom of speech for material that is obscene or indecent or substantially evil, I believe was the word. Maybe it was substantively. In any event, you might enjoy reading it. If you go to my website, harrybrown.org, and click on uh, the radio link and just go to the radio page, you'll see an item there, links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast. And if you click there, then you come to that radio links page, and that's the only item on it for tonight. But there are items there from all the previous broadcasts that you can look at. You might find something interesting there. And, of course, at my website, harrybrown.org, there are tons and tons of articles, literally tons. They're very heavy pieces. And... They're all categorized in a topical index, so you can look up articles on particular subjects that you might be interested in and see what I have to rant about there. But right now, we're talking with Greg in Athens, Georgia, and Greg said that we, if I am quoting him correctly, that we shouldn't blame the presidents too much. They're just doing what comes naturally, that the fault lies with the American people for not uh, keeping a closer rein on the president and Congress and so forth. And I said that the American people are not in a position to do that. Greg, what do you think? Well, I understand what you're saying, but only I can just think of, like, the Social Security. Like, we don't have more people like you or any other people that are against Social Security that are willing to uh, voice their opinion, so they're satisfied with Social Security as we have it now. Well, one of the problems, of course, is the press, that people in the press do not report accurately on bills before Congress and other things. They they pretty much go along with the politicians. If the politicians say a law is designed to make the streets safer, then the press takes them at their word on this, even though what it is is maybe a law to in, intrude the federal government more into local police and make the local police abide by more regulations established in Washington so that they can't do their job as well as they could before. And whatever it may be, we don't get truth in labeling in, in these bills. Nobody explains that a family 
family leave bill, for instance, is going to take privileges away from the employees, not expand their options, but rather restrict their options to just family leave instead of other things that they might have wanted more. And if the press were more accurate in reporting these things, then people might be in a position to realize what's going on. Plus, we got another problem, and that is that the Democrats and the Republicans have created by law a two-party system. This is not the will of the people being expressed that they only want two parties. We're the only country, major country in the Western world that has just two major parties. Uh, Canada, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, all these countries have three major, four major, five major parties in some cases. And uh, America is a two-party system because that's the way the Republicans and Democrats have passed the campaign finance laws, the ballot access laws, and so on, so that even when people realize that they're not getting what they want from Republicans or Democrats, they really have no chance of replacing them with somebody from a third party, so they just choose the lesser of two evils, and as I said earlier, the lesser of two evils then takes that as an endorsement of what he's doing. So, Greg, I'm giving you all this opportunity to talk, and I'm running on and running on. Anything further you want to say before we go to the break? I, I, I agree that. I think more people are actually libertarian. They just don't realize it. Just, uh, I, mean, I think everyone's programmed in the uh, believe that like you're a Republican or a Democrat. Sure, and that's very understandable uh, because that's the way everything is framed in the press and on television and so on, that it's either the Republicans or the Democrats. And when somebody like Ralph Nader comes along, he's just a minor distraction. Nobody expects him to win the presidency. Nobody expects him to do anything except maybe spoil it for the Democrats. And that's as far as it goes. And so people do think of themselves either as Republicans or Democrats. But I think you're absolutely right that most people are basically libertarian. They want to be free to run their own lives. The only problem is they're not so sure sure they want other people to be free to run their lives and that's where we have to educate them that you're better off letting other people be free you'll get more of what you want than if you try to pass laws to restrict them Greg, thanks for calling we're going to break now for the news but when we come back we've got another hour to go so please stay with me this is harry brown thanks so much for tuning in tonight hello again harry brown here we've got the second hour to go here and i'm so glad you're staying with me before we go back to the telephones, I want to mention that there was an excellent article called Now They Tell Us by Michael Massing in the New York Review of Books. It's a lengthy article, but it goes into a lot of detail about how the press failed us in the lead-up to the Iraqi war by not questioning the government, by taking at face value all the things that were said by Colin Powell at the U.N., by George Bush, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and so on, and that there were many, many opportunities for the press to be more skeptical, and the press just simply failed us. And this is part of what we were talking about with Greg in the last hour, that the, the press has failed to accurately report the yes or no situations, the left or right situations, the should we or shouldn't we situations in exactly what is involved in these things. So I strongly recommend that article, and I've posted it on the Radio Links page on harrybrown.org so that you can read it. I think you will find it very a very good summary of the overall situation of how we got conned into the Iraqi war. Let's go back to the phones now and talk with Wyatt in Florida. Good evening, Wyatt. Hello. Hello there. Um, I just wanted to ask you, uh, you said you voted in the 1950s, which was the last time you voted before you voted for yourself. Um, who did you vote for then? Well, actually, I was first eligible to vote in 1954. I was 21 then, but I was uh, overseas uh, serving my country in the United States Army. And uh, so I didn't vote, and I got back. And then in 1956, I voted for Dwight Eisenhower in the presidential election. He again ran against Adlai Stevenson for his re-election. And then I imagine I voted in, oh, yes, I'm sure I voted in 58. There was a, I was living in California, and there was a big, big contest going on for governor. It was William Nolan against uh, Pat Brown, and I was really sure that it was very, 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 very important to the future of California that Nolan get elected, and he didn't. Pat Brown was elected. And then in 1960, I was not going to vote at all, but the day before the presidential election, a friend of mine, whom I respected, talked me into voting for Richard Nixon against Jack Kennedy. Uh, he said that if Nixon were elected, that Barry Goldwater would have access to Nixon and would be a big influence over him. And I bought that and voted for Nixon. And of course, even if Nixon had gotten elected, Goldwater would have had no influence whatsoever. I could see that in retrospect. And I think in 62, I voted in the primary against Richard Nixon when he was running for governor of California. And as I recall, in 1964, I went to the polls on primary day, and I vote, if I remember this correctly, all I did was write in a bunch of names myself, Ayn Rand, a few of my friends, and others, and I didn't actually vote for anybody. And that was the last time I voted until 1996. 32 years went by in between, and I've never regretted that I didn't vote. Um, when did you become a libertarian or hear about them? Or? Well, I think that I was always a libertarian. I won't say all of my life. I've always been an individualist, even when I was a child, but I grew up in uh, and was educated in government schools, 
Uh, but once I got out of high school, I quickly began to abandon the socialist concepts that had been taught to me because I, they just really didn't fit my conception of the way the world worked. And so I was briefly a Republican and thinking that that was the way to smaller government. But by the early 1960s, I had abandoned that. Then I don't know when the word libertarian was first used. I think it was sometime during the 1960s. And then the Libertarian Party started in 1971, and I was sympathetic to them. But I was not a voter, and I was not involved in political action in any way whatsoever. So I didn't join the party until I decided to run for president in 1994. Does that answer the question? <laughs> More than you wanted to know, perhaps. No, it's, uh, yes, it did answer the question. Further questions? No, no other questions. Okay. Wyatt, thanks so much for calling, and good luck to you in your career and your future life. I hope that you succeed and succeed in the private sector and don't pay too much attention to politicians. Let's talk now to Frank in Miami, Florida. Good evening, Frank. How are you, Mr. Harry Brown? I'm just fine. It's uh, great to talk with you. This is the third time I've talked with you now. I first met you back at the uh, Indianapolis Convention, and uh, I met you at the Florida Convention not too long ago, and that uh, was great to see you again. It was uh, a, com- a, a uh, interview you had on National Public Radio back in 2000 that when I was driving through Chicago that turned me on to the Libertarian Party, and I thank you for that because it was a weird venue, but still the message is the point changed my my, uh, my course forever. I had voted for Perot in 92 and 96. Finally found a home in 2000 when I heard him endorse Bush, and I was crazy with that. <laughs> I can't believe he, you know, I, I, I see the error of my ways now, and only when he endorsed Bush, I realized what a huge mistake I had, been, I had made in the last eight years. Um, I, I thanks, thanks to, to your uh, encouragement, or to your, your, your uh, enlightenment, I, I ran for Congress, for Congress up in the Chicago area uh, in 2002, earning 7,000 votes. It was 4.5% four, four of the vote, and... Um, I raised no money at all, and I was really impressed by the results. So as a result, now I'm running again the second time here in Miami, Florida. I'm, I'm listening to you through the uh, through the computer because you guys don't uh, you don't broadcast out here by radio wave. But I'm running against a, a big government Republican, six term, who's been unopposed for five terms. And in answer to Greg's previous call, I, I actually agree with him on what he said about the uh, voter apathy being the main reason. I know it's in disagreement with you, but based on what I've seen, <clears throat> the fact that, for example, the only election he he had in the opposition was in '98 against the Democrat when only 45% of those who were eligible, eligible to vote even bothered to vote. I'm inclined, unfortunately, to really blame the majority of those who are not voting. 55% as just an example in my particular district, which I think is, if uh, brought out as an example nationally, probably comes out to about the same average, more or less. Before you go on, let me see if I got this straight. Did you say that you do blame those who don't vote? Or? I, I, I do. I, I think that the okay. public is mostly to blame because a lot of them... Uh, you know, I, I get, uh, for example, as I'm, as I'm petitioning for signatures, and by the way, I am doing my own signature petitioning. I'm, I'm actually saying, for example, uh, hi, I'm running for Congress. Would you help me get on the ballot? And they say things like, no, thank you. And I, and I, I am bold enough to say, well, don't thank me. You're, you're only hurting yourself. <laughs> I mean, all, all I'm doing is try to get on the ballot. You can hear me debate later on. And, and the fact that there's been no opposition, literally, for five of the last six elections in this congressional district, and if you saw the shape of the district, needless to say, as many of your listeners might not know, the whole issue of gerrymandering, where they basically choose their voters well in advance, sure. you realize why the incumbency rate is so ridiculously high. Having lived in Illinois, as you said earlier, about the uh, the way that laws are stacked against third parties, you know, in, in Illinois it takes the Republicans and Democrats only need 5,000 signatures apiece to get on the ballot, and, and their their petitions go pretty much uncontested, while the, uh, Repo- the Libertarians, are in, in our case, back in 2002, just to get our candidate for governor on the ballot, we needed five times as many, and this is by law. Yes. So when they say this is a free and fair election process, it's, it's definitely not fair, and, I'll, and, I, and to your listeners, I'll show how it's not free either. It costs a dollar a signature for the average petitioner to go out there and collect signatures, because let's face it, no one wants to do that for free. It's a, it's a really a time-consuming and, and really uh, sweatful job. Uh, we had to get twice as many as that, because we predicted correctly that the Republican Party in Illinois' case, for example, was going to try to disqualify us. And they did. They tried the best they could to knock us off the ballot, because they were afraid of the impact we were going to have. They know they, they are fearing us now, because we are making a huge difference. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they succeeded the first time, but the second time in 2002, we were prepared for what, for what they were going to try to do. And this time we won. We, we won the ballot uh, contest. But the whole free and fair election... But at a great cost. Oh, horribly. The money could have gone instead to, to getting our candidate on the ballot. Uh, I'm sorry, to getting our candidate uh, uh, campaigning. You know, it, it, this, yes. this is the reason why they don't hear about us, because, you know, they think, well, nobody likes to hear about you. But, but that's not the case. The very no, laws are stacked against us. Absolutely. In the 2000 presidential election, we raised a total of about $2.5 million between what the party raised specifically for the presidential campaign and what my campaign raised directly. Right. And about 250000 of that went into just getting on the ballot oh. in two states. Two oh. states, Pennsylvania and Arizona, consumed right. 10% of what we had raised. And so with the other expenses you have and so on, we didn't get to do nearly...
nearly the amount of advertising that we had wanted to do. We produced four beautiful one-minute ads. We had a 30-minute infomercial, and they did get on the air, but we had intended that they would get much, much more coverage than they did. Right. But but uh, we had to use up so much of that money. And, of course, that was just two states. The party itself spent oodles and oodles of money on other states like Oklahoma, North Carolina, and some of the really bad states in the country. So right. uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And people don't understand that this is that it's a logistical, technical problem. Uh, we, we got uh, an email, for instance, from uh, Martin in Phoenix who says, since you're talking about elections tonight, why is it that other third parties seem to get much more media attention than the Libertarian Party? The, the Greens and the Reform Party have always gotten so much more press during election years. And, of course, the answer is because they have candidates who are celebrities. Right, exactly. By the way, I commend you. You, above all the other third parties, which is another thing that I find highly respectable about the Libertarians, for not taking, for not taking stolen federal uh, dollars. Absolutely. Uh, hang on, if you like. We're going to be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Stay with us. We're talking with Frank in Miami, Florida. Frank, did you have a final point to make? Oh, no, I just, I just wanted to say thanks for the, for the show. This is the first time I've actually tuned in to listen, and uh, keep, keep doing a great job. I'm, I'm really, really glad that the Libertarian movement's getting more and more momentum. I have a lot of people here in the district, or, yeah, in, in District 21 here in Florida, by the way. What geographic area does that cover? It's the west side of Miami. It goes from southwest Broward County all the way down through, the west, through west Miami down to as far south as about Cutler Ridge. If you look at the borders, uh, it's really an odd shape. Can I mention my website? Oh, by all means. Oh, thank you. It's www.gonzalez, G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z, for Congress, that's the word for, dot org. And it gives a, there's a picture in there of, the, of the, uh, the district. I hope there are people in Miami listening, or even in South Broward. Um, thanks to you, I'm doing this. I'm an average citizen, no riches, no connections, no political or law degree. Uh, I've just learned so much in the last four years, thanks to your basically alerting me to this. I didn't know it existed, and I can't tell you, this is like, <laughs> it's, it's almost like a... Uh, like a uh, like I found I don't know what I'd say religious experience, but I don't want to make associations there. <laughs> okay, I understand. I understand. All I can say is that even if you did have riches, by the time your campaign's over, you won't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. I appreciate your time. Thank you for calling, Frank, okay, and uh, good luck to you. Thank you. Let's talk with Ron in Pittsburgh. Good evening, Ron. Oh, hi, it's Rob, actually. How you oh, doing? Rob, yes, of course. How are you doing tonight, Rob? Uh, not bad. Uh, I missed the first half of your show, unfortunately. So. Oh, well, I'll give you a 35-minute summary of uh, it. Well, I just hope my question isn't redundant. If you have time, i got two questions, one political, one economic. All right. Um, the political thing has to do with what you've been talking about with people like Wyatt. Um, I personally do regret the fact that I didn't start voting Libertarian as soon as I was old enough to vote. And I just got my new voters card in the mail, so I'm finally officially registered as Libertarian. And as I told you before, I joined the party at all the levels. Of, mm-hmm. you know. But, um, you know, I feel, I feel like a uh, fool for having been a Democrat. for. I mean, I was never a member of the Democratic Party, but I was registered as a Democratic voter. And I feel like a fool for having fallen for all that. It's just that, you know, I just didn't know any better. I didn't know enough about the Libertarian Party until I was a little older. And um, so for me, it's been a long process, but like your last caller, you know, it's been like a religious experience for me, too. But um, I guess my question, my first question for you is, why don't you regret the fact that you didn't start voting Libertarian earlier? Well, you can't know everything. And yeah. the, to think that you should have been voting Libertarian before you ever even heard of it, it just doesn't add up. Well, that's and, true. And if you did know about it, and I did know about it, I, I don't remember when I first heard of the Libertarian Party, probably not right at the beginning when when they ran their first candidate in 72, but I probably knew about it by the late 70s. But I was definitely apolitical at the time. I never tried to tell other people what to do with their lives, but I certainly wrote about it in How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World and in my investment newsletter that I just didn't see any point in trying to choose among these people. And I don't see anything wrong with that, and I don't argue with anybody today who says, look, I'm just simply not going to vote at all, and that includes not voting Libertarian. But I do think that if you are going to vote, that you definitely ought to vote Libertarian. Here in Tennessee, for instance, I... See, no point in going to the polls and voting for anything but the presidential candidate because a libertarian can't even have the word libertarian next to his name on the ballot. Yeah, that's criminal right there. So somebody runs for Congress, and who cares how many votes he gets? It it, it adds nothing to the image of libertarians, and uh, it's unfortunate. And until that law law is changed in Tennessee, there really is no point in voting. Uh, If you vote for a presidential candidate, then at least you're adding to whatever vote total he's going to get around the country. Yeah. This is something that everybody has to decide for himself. And even if you decide to vote Republican or Democrat, I'm not going to condemn you for it. I will pity you, but I, <laughs> but I will not condemn you for it. Well, my other question is more economic, I suppose. Um, I, uh, you know, I was reading that book by Murray Rothbard, the econo- the late economist, mm-hmm. um, the uh, the Libertarian Manifesto book, and he talks about the Federal Reserve System and the folly of Keynesian economics and such in there. And he explains why getting off the gold standard has been a big disaster. And he explains how before, when we were still on the gold standard, because of economic growth and just greater technology, and, you know, ever-increasing technology and efficiency in the um, market system, in the private sector, prices of goods and services were going down. But ever since the Federal Reserve System started inflating the money supply, prices just keep going up. And 
he basically made it sound like the Federal Reserve System has no merit whatsoever and it's just a, a tool of government to try to give itself some extra power. Um, however, on the other hand, some people have told me that there are other arguments on the other side. And well, let's hear those arguments when we come back from the break. Stay okay. with us. And you stay with us, too, because we've still got a half an hour to go, and we will continue this discussion right after this break. Welcome back. Harry Brown here, and we're talking with Rob in Pittsburgh about the gold standard, and he pointed out that Murray Rothbard said that when the country was on a gold standard, a strict gold standard, before the Federal Reserve moved in in 1913, that prices tended to trend downward with the advances in technology and mass production and so forth, but that there were arguments on the other side, and you were about to tell us what those arguments were. Yeah, well, one of the people I spoke with is a friend of mine who's studying at Carnegie Mellon University's Graduate School of um, Industrial Administration, and he was saying that there aren't enough, there isn't enough gold in the world to support the modern economy on a gold standard. Um, I'm surprised you didn't run into that in Rothbard's writings because I know he's dealt with that. There is no particular amount of gold that is necessary to support a currency because you could be dealing in grams of gold, tenths of grams of gold, hundreds of grams of gold. It isn't the quantity of gold that's important. It's the fact that there is a fixed relationship between the currency and the gold. That is that one dollar is equal to one twentieth of an ounce of gold or one one hundredth of an ounce of gold or whatever it may be. In fact, there is more than enough gold in the world to support all the currencies of the world. And in fact, if, um, if in fact the population and production and everything expanded and gold became, seemed to become scarce, this would just cause gold mining companies to go into reserves that were harder to get at because gold would become more valuable and would buy more products. And so there's really no problem about the quantity of gold. That's, that's an argument. Well, yeah, I mean, what you're saying makes sense to me. I didn't really think that that it mattered, you know, uh, what, like what, what my friend was saying, I sort of thought, well, so what? I mean, it just means that you can buy more goods and services, you know, as, as they become sure. cheaper, you can just buy more of them. With, with Right, and the gold becomes more valuable, so people expend more effort trying to find gold because it's now more valuable. The opposite argument has also been raised, that if you're on a gold standard, then you are vulnerable to new discoveries in gold and so on. But the fact is that when the Spanish conquistadors came to uh, the Americas, and found all kinds of gold deposits and so on and took that gold back to Spain, it didn't ruin the currencies of Europe. Europe absorbed the gold very easily. Most of these things are like the old arguments about, gee, if you didn't have federal regulation, some company would lower its prices, drive everybody out of business, and then with no competition it would raise its prices. Well, to the sky. I still meet none, of these things, none of these things ever happen in the real world well, is I the point meet, I want to make. I still meet people who argue that every week I meet people who argue that with me. And the simple answer to it is, well, name one example of when this happened. And well, they can't say, come up with an example. People keep telling me about, I don't know, Standard Oil. or And I keep thinking, what are these situations where they were using the power of government to get special favors and it wasn't truly free market? Well, Sta know? Standard Oil was one of the ones that was pretty much free market. And they just kept buying up other oil companies and lowering the price of oil. Thanks to Standard Oil, people had heating in their homes that couldn't afford the heat before and had to deal with wood stoves and things of this sort that were very dangerous. And now they had uh, gas stoves because of the heat. Uh, heating oil that was available, that it brought heating to families that couldn't possibly afford it before, and they never did raise their prices, no matter how many companies that they bought out, no matter how many companies they might have driven out of business with their lower and lower prices, they never did raise their prices back up until the federal government moved in and started regulating them and keeping competition out, and at that point, Standard Oil began to stabilize its prices, and that was the end of lower and lower prices. Federal yeah, well, regulation has never benefited the consumers. It has always turned out to be for the benefit of the producers. Well, here's the thing. Um, that same friend of mine, the graduate student, he said that de deflation is a bad thing. Now, I'm not sure if I'm using the term correctly, but he was saying that if prices just keep going down and down and down, I was saying that this is a good thing, because then even the poor people have a... Uh, an improvement in the standard of living. Sure. But he was saying, oh, but when prices go down, people stop buying things because then their weight, like you, you don't buy a car this year because you're expecting it to be cheaper next year, and you don't buy a computer this year because you're expecting it to be cheaper next year. And this argument kind of made sense to me, but it didn't quite make sense. Well, in, the, in all the history of the United States, when prices have gone down, it has not stopped people from buying because most of what they are going to buy, they need to buy this year, even if they think it's going to be less expensive next year. But actually, what, 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 but what happens is that as prices go down, it makes the gold more valuable. And so people start mining more gold as a result of it. And when more gold comes onto the market, the prices come back up again. Now, this, this reaction, this 
self-regulation doesn't occur week by week, but it does occur year by year. And so what happened over the 100 years before the start of the Federal Reserve System was that prices did go down about a third from where they were at the beginning of the 1800s, but they went down so gradually that the price decreases had no wrenching effect upon the economy, not like in the 1930s when prices dropped 25 percent within a period of four years. That was the result of Federal Reserve intervention in the economy. That's what happens when the government intervenes. Everything becomes chaotic. But in the free market, things happen gradually, and they happen naturally, and the and problems that develop when people are doing bad things in the market produce their own reactions, and that is other people come in and say, I can protect you from these people that are doing the bad things. They're not giving you good products. I'll guarantee my products. They're not treating you well at work. I'll give you better working conditions, whatever it may be. So the free market is, as Sharon Harris said, the invisible hand is a gentle hand. The, the hand of government is a slap on the face. Thank Rob, thanks so much for calling. Thank you. Let's go quickly now to Connecticut and talk with Michael. Michael, you still with us? Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for holding on so long. Yeah, sure. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask you about something that I kind of assumed somebody would have asked you about by now, but I guess not, which is the uh, the Haiti situation. Ah, oh, good question. Uh, isn't it interesting about, what, what would it be now, about 10 years ago, Clinton sent troops into Haiti uh, because uh, things were just terrible there, and so what he did was he used the force of the United States government to put uh, Jean Aristide on the throne there in Haiti and make everything okay, and now 10 years later, we're sending troops in there to get Jean Aristide out of government. Uh, isn't that strange? Can you imagine the U.S. government taking two different sides on the same issue? I guess they've never done that. Well, maybe they did with the Soviet Union. They did that with Iraq. They've done that with Pakistan. They've done that. Well, I guess they've done it with just about every country in the world at one time or another. And I hear now that they want to put more troops in so that uh, we can fix the problems we called last time. <laughs> well, of course. Government is its own best friend. Government is always creating problems that justify government coming to the rescue. As I've said uh, so many times, I'm sure there are people listening to this program who are sick of hearing me say it. Government is one, good at one thing. It knows how to break your legs and and then hand you a crutch and say, see, if it weren't for the government, you couldn't walk. So, any further thoughts about this, Michael? I don't know. I mean, I guess I can almost, I almost kind of wish, like, you know, just hearing about the anti rc rebels, if we could uh, get rid of our government so easily, but uh, I guess I'm <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, they're, they're paying a price for it down there. Obviously, a lot of people are dying, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. But it does point out the folly of thinking that our government is going to make things right and peaceful and just and fair in some other country. Again, Michael, thanks for staying on the line so long, and join us anytime you feel like it and anytime you've got anything to say. Let me take a few emails here. A nice email from David in Minneapolis. He says, Ashcroft announced this week that the U.S. Justice Department is going to start aggressively prosecuting pornographers. I'm not in, not sure what material he intends to go after or what kind of material that he thinks the federal government has the authority to censor. The words obscene and pornographic seem to have as many definitions as there are English speakers. Have I have you heard anything about this? And uh, I I really haven't heard anything about it, David. David goes on to say, unless they're talking about going after specific operations that coerce people or employ children, then this is probably going to be just another manifestation of people using the force of government to choose how people live their lives. Very true. And, of course, on top of that, it's completely unconstitutional, not only on the grounds that the government should not be interfering with freedom of press or freedom of speech, but also because the government has no authority to prosecute common crimes. That was meant to be done by state and local governments. The federal government should not be prosecuting drug uh, abuse. It should not be aiding police force. It should not have laws against carjacking or any of these things because the federal government has no authority whatsoever to be dealing with common crimes. In a further note, David says, I get a kick out of anti-porn crusaders who talk about protecting community values when they're trying to run adult entertainment establishments out of, time, out of town. It seems to me that these kinds of businesses are generally not started by independently wealthy perverts who wake up one day and say, gee, I think I'll open a smut magazine store just to annoy people. If these businesses are there for more than a few weeks, then they are generating enough business to stay afloat financially. As you mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to keep a small business running even without government regulations. Thus, if an adult entertainment establishment was truly contrary to community values, it would go out of business. If one of these establishments makes enough profits to stay in business, then obviously a significant segment of the community values that establishment. Well, you have really touched on an important point, David. We hear over and over again that these laws exist, whatever they may be. Whatever the kind of laws you're talking about, they exist because the people want them. No, laws exist because the people don't want them. Laws are using the force of government to impose fines and imprisonment on people to keep them from doing what they want to do. If nobody wanted pornographic material in a town, for instance, there would be no pornography store because, as David pointed out, it couldn't survive. It's the fact that it does have community support, that people are willing to buy its products and so on, that the government moves in to counter what society has brought about. Regulations that the federal government imposes on business 
or to stop business from doing what it has to do to make a profit. And, of course, it makes a profit by pleasing its customers and hiring employees in a way that employees want to stay working for them. So the government is always working counter to it. Now, you can say that in some cases some people in the community want the porno store and some people don't. Yes, and maybe a majority of them uh, don't want it, but by, of course, kicking the porno store out of business, they're setting the precedent that now the city officials have the power to kick out of business anybody that is not doing what they want, which means providing competition for the businessmen who have the greatest influence. Uh, another point, I guess this is from Same David. He says, a new segment over the news break played a clip from a Bush speech about how he wants to continue to dr reduce drug use in America. I don't see how he's going to accomplish this when so much of what he does drives me to drink. Good point. Another mic, this one in Jacksonville, Florida, in response to your statement regarding America's innate Libertarian spirit, unfortunately, I found that all Americans hate dictatorships unless it's a dictatorship with which they agree. Well, we've got to take a break right now. We'll be back for the final segment. No more time for phone calls, so don't call in now. We'll be back in just a minute. Well, this is Harry Brown, and I do want to thank you very, very much for tuning in this evening, and I want to thank uh, Aaron Armstrong for taking care of everything in Washington so that we can be connected with you. And uh, for most of the past two hours, we've been talking about elections, so let me wind this up with some further email comments that have come in. Bob recites the oft-heard slogans, if you're 20 and you don't vote for a Democrat, you have no heart. If you're 40 and you don't vote Republican, you have no mind. And he adds to it, if you're able to vote and don't vote Libertarian, you have no common sense. Clinton in Eufaula, Alabama, asks, do you think that because Libertarians disagree on the war in Iraq, the turnout in November will be compromised? No, I don't believe that it will be, Clinton. I think that the vast majority of Libertarians, at least those that belong to the party, have been opposed to the war on Iraq, and there have been a few rank-and-file people who have expressed uh, support for what George Bush is doing, and a few prominent people like Neil Bortz and Larry Elder and some others who call themselves libertarians and have been supporting the war. But I think, generally speaking, libertarians have been opposed to the war. A lot of them even opposed the war in Afghanistan and have opposed the war on terror from the beginning, and that number seems to grow more and more all the time. Clinton also asked, do you know if David Nolan is in support for the war? No, I don't know. David Nolan was the founder of the Libertarian Party, and he will be speaking at the Libertarian Convention Memorial Day weekend this year. And finally, from Doug out there in cyberspace, he says, I disagree with 5 to 10 percent of what you say. Here's another example. On the one hand, you say if you vote for a Democrat or Republican, you deserve exactly what you get and have nobody else to blame. Then on the other, you say that the American people aren't responsible for what the United States government does. If the people aren't responsible for what the government does, then who is? George Bush isn't responsible. George Bush is not going to be killed in action. Also, if Americans aren't responsible for what the U.S. government does, then why were they ever given the ability to vote in the first place, or why, when Congress raises taxes, do Americans pay for it and not the people in Greenland or Iceland or something? I mean, if Americans aren't responsible for what the United States government does, then why do Americans receive the consequences of Congress's tax increases and not the man on the moon or something? Sometimes I think you betray responsibility as something that is always fair. I think he means portray responsibility as something that is always fair. It isn't always fair. It's just a lot better than the alternative. I mean, who are you willing? Who are you blaming for the fact that Americans don't know what liberty is? George Bush. Well, let me just quickly say this: that you do deserve what you get if you vote for it, and that doesn't mean that you. If you don't vote, that you don't deserve it uh, or that you deserve that or, or anything of the sort. It's just simply that if you vote for these people, you are encouraging them. Your vote isn't going to make that much difference, but you're still encouraging them, and you really have no reason to complain then if you get what you voted for. Now, with regard to whether or not the American people are responsible for this, the Founding Fathers knew what government is. There's a quote attributed to George Washington, which I've never been able to track down, but it really sums up the Founding Fathers' attitude, and that is that government is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. And they tried to keep this thing in check. The idea was that if government were small enough, it didn't really matter who was president. It didn't matter who was co in Congress, because those people were very limited in what they could do. But the Constitution was not self-enforcing, and so the politicians were able to get around it. And as they made the government bigger and bigger, it became harder and harder for people to keep track of what was going on. And more and more people started voting out of self-defense. If I'm going to be taxed so much, then I want to get something back from the government. And that's when it became the free-for-all that it has been over the last hundred years or so. I don't blame the American people, as I said earlier. They can't be expected under the circumstances to know everything that is going on. It is up to us to take the story to them. And that's why we have to be preachers. That's why we have to go out and proselytize. We have to explain to people. We can't expect them to come to us. Thank you very, very much for joining me this evening. I hope you have a good week, and I hope you don't let George Bush and the Congress get you down. Maybe there are better days ahead. This is Harry Brown. I look forward to talking with you again next Saturday night. Good night. Good night.